Namaste and greetings. I, Ritika Sundar, a visiting researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evamniti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, warmly welcome you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a panel discussion on COP26 and locally led adaptations in India and Bangladesh Sundarbans. This talk is a part of the series, The State of the Environment, Hashtag Planet Tax, which is organized by Hashtag Impre Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development. Today, it is my honor to introduce the chair and the panelists. The chair for today's deliberation is Dr. Jayata Basu, Director, Nonprofit NGO, faculty at Calcutta University and an environmental journalist at the Telegraph ABB. With the permission of the chair, I would like to introduce the panelists. Ritika, go ahead. Thank you, sir. The distinguished panelists include Professor Sawanik Roy, Professor, Department of Architecture, Town and Regional Planning, and Founder Director of the School of Ecology, Infrastructure and Human Settlement Management, Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology at Shibpur. Professor Andy Large, Professor of River Science at Newcastle University, UK, Principal Investigator and Director at UKRI, GCRF Living Deltas Hub. Professor Salim ul -Huk, Director, International Center for Climate Change and Development and Professor at Independent University, Bangladesh. Professor Manoj Roy, Assistant Professor in Sustainability, Lancaster University in UK. The two presenters are Dr. Upasna Ghosh, Faculty at Indian Institute of Public <clears throat> Health, Bhubaneswar, and Dr. Debajoti Das, Anthropologist of South Asia, Principal Investigator, SSRC Environmental Refugees Project. We look forward to learning from our distinguished speakers and we also look forward to an enriching deliberation. With that, I invite Dr. Sini Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director in Pre-New Delhi and the moderator of today's session to take over. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Ritika, and good evening, everyone. I hope you're all keeping well and safe. So uh, today we have gathered for the panel discussion, which is very important with respect to the populace and their living conditions in the Sundarbans Delta on both the Indian and the Bangladeshi side. So as you all know that the population has exhibited a lot of resilience amid frequent natural hazards. And according to a list which is maintained by the weather underground, 30, 26 of the 35 most deadliest tropical cyclones of the world has been recorded in this, um, uh, in this region. And further, the recent pandemic has added a new dimension to the Delta's precarious environment. And despite the above, the locally led adaptations to address climate change and natural disasters in this subcontinent has been very, very effective. And this has had a significant bearing for the socioeconomic and policy relevance. So today's panel discussion will bring and brings together uh, experts who have been working on the Sundarbans on both India and Bangladeshi side. Uh, this discussion becomes especially very important in light of the recently concluded COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, Professor Shobhanik Roy, as Ritika has mentioned, he has worked in an inter international consortium funded by the UKRIRC UK under the leadership of Newcastle University UK, and he will be speaking on the Indian Sundar Sundarbans. Professor Andy Large, he directs the UKRI RC UK Living Deltas Hub, and he would be speaking from the hub's perspective and his experiences. Professor Salim Ulhaq, Director of ICAD Bangladesh, will be speaking on Bangladesh Sundarbans. Professor Manoj Roy will be also sharing his views and experiences of working on the Bangladesh Sundarbans. And further, uh, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute being a collaborator in the uh, SSRC Trans-Regional Project on environmental refugees, climate, health, and livelihood in the Indian Ocean world, with Sundarbans being one of the sites of inquiry, there will be a small presentation by Dr. Upasana Ghosh and Dr. Devujyoti Das, uh, who will be presenting some findings from the ongoing research. Dr. Das is the lead project, lead PI of the project, and Dr. Upasana is a, uh, is a member. 
So welcome everyone, and I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Jayanta Basu, sir, if you can hear me. Can you hear me, sir? So please unmute yourself, and uh, I request you to uh, share your opening remarks. Uh, yes, am I audible sir? now? Yes. Finally, finally, finally. Sorry, sorry, everybody. Uh, this technology often puts us in a bit of a soup, and I yeah. have been in a bit of a soup. Third, third instrument through which I could could get connected. The laptop failed, the desktop failed, and the mobile finally was the savior for the day. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mehta, for the introduction. Uh, let, let, as because already we started about five minutes late, I still go to the topics. Uh, well, I think uh, we are going to discuss a very important topics in context to the uh, local adaptation in Shundarbans. I think both Indian Shundarbans and Bangladesh Shundarban. And this whole process is also getting important in context to this recently concluded COP26, where uh, these issues have been discussed at length. Uh, we have a, a fabulous panel to, to discuss this whole agenda. Uh, being privileged to be uh, knowing few of them closely and personally. Uh, Dr. Hawk, Salimul Hawk, one of the, one of the biggest voices in global climate negotiation, uh, especially from South Asia. And uh, there are many others uh, who are be contributing immensely to the whole cause. Before, I, I don't want to take much time. I just would like to flag up a few issues before we go on uh, kind of hearing the, uh, the experts. Uh, as I understand that each of the experts will be talking for about 15 minutes, and then there'll be a presentation for 10 minutes, and then I'll try to round up and then we'll open to the questions. I just would like to mention a few points. I think we all know that Shundarban is one of the most uh, vulnerable part of the world in context to climate change. If you compare Shundarbans, which is spread between India and Bangladesh, with the, with the countries, with the island countries, you will understand the vulnerability. Shundarbans population density is higher. Shundarbans per capita income is lower. And if you look at the physical part of the climate change, both uh, the long-term climate change uh, and the immediate climate change, Shundarban is one of the topper. If you take the immediate climate change, the storms and cyclones, you will find that Shundarban in last uh, about 100 years, 26% growth in high, high intensity cyclones. The, perhaps the overall cyclone number has remained constant, but the high intensity cyclones has increased. And uh, recently, IMD, Indian Meteorological Department, has come up with a report, a national report, which shows that the return period for cyclone is least in Indian Shundarban. It's about 1.6 years for considering all kinds of cyclones. And if you consider the severe cyclones, it is about 2.6. So that kind of sums up the vulnerability in terms of the kind of a immediate nature. And also there has been a study from World Bank, which shows that in Eastern Bank of India, uh, the, the cyclone, median of cyclone is now shifting from Andhra Pradesh to Orissa and Sundarban. So both in terms of number and also in terms of topographical point, Sundarban has become vulnerable. Then you come to the long-term kind of problem that the erosion and the sea level rise. Shundarban sea level rise is about eight millimeter per, per year, which is more than double of the global average. And Bangladesh may be even, even worse than that. And if you add that Shundarban being a newer area, being settling down about four millimeter per year, so it's an enormous about 12 millimeter per year, we are set, we are, the relative sea level rise is about 12 millimeter per year. And Shundarban in India has seen an erosion of about 210 square kilometer in last five decades. 210 square kilometers means an area greater than the city of Kolkata. So that's a part of the vulnerability. And then you add on to that, Shundarban's people, average per capita income is pretty low. And the, and the poverty uh, kind of index in Shundarban is double than the national average. So in one side, you are talking about high level of vulnerability. In other side, you are talking about the low level of uh, resilience. So that prompts a set of experts to, to propose that you need a mitigation measure. Maybe you need to shift 
a large amount of population from Sundarban to a safer area to make them uh, less vulnerable. That easier said than done. Sundarban, as I already said, has a population about 4.5 million. And even if you take 25% is vulnerable, you are talking about 1.5 million. It's absolutely impossible to ship this enormous number of people. So really we need to look at the adaptation measures, how we can kind of minimize the vulnerability, keeping the people in Sundarban where they are. Yes, some people need to be shifted, which are extremely vulnerable, but may not be uh, at the scale the some experts are proposing. So what are the possible ways of uh, kind of uh, working on the adaptation measures? I'm just listing few, I'm just flagging on the points and then uh, we'll keep on discussing. I think one very important part is a joint effort of India and Bangladesh. Since 2010, there has been an initiative on civil society and government level to work together. That has come to a certain level, but that needs to go to the next level. So India, Bangladesh should know from each other, should learn from each other, should unlearn from each other how to go about the adaptation measure. In the, next is the ecotourism. Uh, over the last maybe uh, decade, I have been speaking on, on camera, actually recording it, wide section of people, from the people at on ground to the politician, to the executives and everybody. And one point coming out, the game changer for Sundarban can be legalized proper ecotourism. That can add to the resilience of the local people and that can actually opens up a lot of, lot of uh, other points. So that is another point I would like to know that whether it is a possibility, then creating alternate source of livelihood. As of now, the people in Sundarban mainly depend on agriculture, fishery, honey collection for their livelihood. Can we think about other kind of uh, livelihood? For example, uh, something on, on, on transportation, water transport, something on ecotourism, maybe some green industries which are not affecting the environment. So that needs to be looked into. Then there is also the mangrove plantation that's being already uh, being done in various places, whether that is, a, uh, that, is, that is how much doable, because once you put up the mangrove, it takes time to kind of do that. Then the legislative measure, uh, can we take or should we take legislative measures to kind of uh, take into consideration all this? So there is a whole lot of points. I don't want to drag that list. There are a lot of other points. So just flagging on with few pointers and would like to uh, kind of go directly to the experts to hear what they are uh, going to offer and what they are saying. But finally, I just would like to conclude the initial kind of pointers with this particular, uh, I, I think I would say point that uh, to me, it's very important for Indian Sundarban and Bangladesh Sundarban to work together, both at the government level, but also at the track two level, track three level, within the academicians, within the civil society. So uh, how can we take it forward? How practical it is to take forward? We have, as I said, reached to a certain level, but it needs to be further strengthened. So with that, I, I conclude for the time being and would like to uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Mehta to look at, to see the schedule and uh, request the first uh, speaker to go ahead with his presentation. Thank you. Um, so, um... Maybe you could invite the speakers uh, based on your uh, chronology that you would want to. Up to you, sir. Okay. The uh, I am right now having not the program with me. Uh, well, the first speaker who is supposed to be the first speaker. Sir, so, uh, Professor Shobhanik Roy. Professor Shobhanik Roy. Great. Uh, so, Professor Roy, uh, please start. I know that you have been working in uh, Indian Shundarban for uh, for a very important project. So. If we can talk about the Indian Sundarban and how the adaptive measures can be taken, it will be great. So let's start with Dr. Shobhani Dr. Roy. Oh, Thank you, uh, the Dr. Thank you. The floor Kostu. is yours. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Thanks to uh, uh, pre Impact and Policy Research Institute for organizing uh, this very important event uh, and uh, giving me the opportunity uh, for sharing my uh, experiences and thoughts on this. And it is also uh, it is my privilege to share screen with uh, many of my friends and colleagues with whom we are working for quite some time in this project and previously also. And um, uh, also Dr. Jantabasu, thanks for your very, uh, for setting the context so well 
for this uh, whole discussion. So without, uh, as I know, we know that there is uh, very limited time, so, and we have a uh, lot to uh, discuss and share. So I'll be just uh, sharing my screen uh, to put uh, uh, things uh, uh, briefly. Sir, let me share it. No, I, I, I'm just, uh, yeah. So can you see the screen? Yes, it's working. You can go full screen, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. So uh, the, uh, uh, the the title of my my uh, uh, presentation is COP26 and locally led adaptation in Indian Sundarbans. Uh, very briefly about this background of locally led adaptation, it's a kind of uh, uh, which has been discussed uh, thoroughly in this uh, COP26. It is a new way of building climate resilience that uh, locates the priorities, expertise, and knowledge of local people and institutions who are on the front lines of climate change. And this is uh, a, actually a growing priority among the uh, governments, among civil society organizations, and also the funding agencies uh, uh, in the COP26. And uh, it is being suggested that the focus should be shifting more from the uh, centralized adaptation and mitigation towards uh, uh, local uh, locally led adaptation. And a certain amount of uh, international funding has also been committed and uh, stage is being set for, uh, for the funding. But the main question is, will these commitments uh, actually be translating into action, uh, considering the kind of uh, complexities uh, in the landscape and the and the population. And in that, uh, what is to be done? Uh, let us see what is happening in Indian uh, Sundarban. So uh, as we know that uh, Indian Sundarban is uh, part is, is an integral part of the, the total Sundarban, which is in Bengali language, which is uh, called the, uh, the uh, forest of beautiful trees, which is a hydrological system. Uh, the second largest hydrological system after the Amazon, that is the GBM, uh, uh, Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Meghna Delta. And this uh, Shundarpan forest is uh, the, among the largest mangrove forest, which is also a biodiversity hotspot with hundreds of endangered species and the megafauna of tiger. And this is being declared as a world heritage site, uh, uh, reflecting its, uh, its uh, conservation importance. And also there is a long uh, history of coexistence of man and nature and animal for almost uh, the the written history shows that almost we have an uh, uh, um, uh, 2,500 years or more of uh, coexistence of man and nature. And in Indian part, it is about 4.5 million people, which is one of the, the, the dense, uh, very high density uh, region in terms of the uh, forest uh, ecosystem. So if you see that uh, the, the very the, the complex landscape is uh, uh, actually represented to the to the dynamics and the, uh, the deficiencies in the Delta. So as I was telling, and as, as Professor Basu was also mentioning that it is a rich biodiversity with uh, mega and uh, microfauna flora, but it is also a fragile ecology with uh, uh, rising erosion and salinity. The number of uh, climate hazards are increasing every day. And it is also a um, it, uh, ecosystem which uh, comprises of multiple sub ecosystems, which is very unique feature uh, of aquatic and terrestrial sub ecosystems and multiple occupations. And also it is inhabited by a large section of very poor population, not only in terms of income, but also in terms of the below poverty line population with uh, uh, almost 70% do not have agricultural lands and also uh, due to the frequent uh, hazards, uh, cyclones, storm surge, and flooding, uh, just a recent uh, um, survey data shows that almost 20% of the uh, households uh, of the uh, population are now have now migrated out. So, which is actually a major concern, which is being actually shown as a kind of coping strategy or a adaptation strategy. But there's a big question around that whether the the kind of coping strategy what population is adapting that it's actually helping the, the, the families to survive or creating new kind of uh, problems, uh, social problems and other kind of uh, family related problems because many of the students, very recently we have done a survey in Goshaba where the, the, um, head, uh, the headmaster of the school was telling that 75% of the children who were during the lockdown period, 
75% uh, of the children, uh, the, their, uh, their parents have moved out. So that's the kind of uh, situation which we are now confronting with, uh, along with the climate uh, hazards. So if you see the, the coping strategies or adaptation uh, measures, uh, it's, uh, these are the, some of the glimpses of this, that uh, the uh, continuous submergence of uh, agricultural lands and homestead lands and fisheries, uh, collapsing embankments, uh, which, is, which are also very uh, major, uh, major issue in the area, the, the collapse of very rudimentary mud houses, mud and thatch houses, which is 70% uh, of the houses in this region are mud, and a uh, um, uh, uh, precarious drinking water uh, situation where almost the uh, women are forced to uh, move almost uh, the, uh, at least three, four kilometers uh, away from their home when uh, there is a kind of environmental stress or, or hazard. And this is a 2019 hazard uh, vulnerability map which shows uh, the, the coastal blocks of Shagar, Namkhana, Patotmatima, Kagdeep, and also the other seven or eight uh, forest uh, uh, buffer blocks like Goshaba, Bashanti, Hingalganj. They are uh, highly uh, high and very high vulnerability because of uh, erosion and also due to the uh, changing uh, resource base and also the intense man-animal conflict uh, because of regular interface of uh, uh, the entry of uh, local population or forest dependent population into the forest because of the, the, the uh, scarcity of uh, other livelihood options. So the coping strategies, what we see here are, are also quite well known and uh, photographs uh, are available all around the newspapers and in social media. That's uh, the kind of uh, community involvement in uh, the uh, embankment restoration, very, very, uh, with very local material of mud, the protection of houses by using a rudimentary construction of uh, covering with tarpaulin sheets or very little amount of resources what they have conversion of agricultural lands due to the rising salinity towards uh, prawn cultivation and fisheries. And also there are, with the help of uh, the NGOs and civil society organizations, there are also some renewable energy devices like uh, the, uh, um, like, um, the uh, photovoltaic cells for uh, alternative energy sources. Now, uh, the, what we see in the present situation, particularly for last two, one year or so, uh, we are finding the state responses are mostly uh, um, on hard infrastructure, like uh, the emphasis is on building of cyclone shelters and uh, to earn revenue from tourism, roads uh, and bridges and other things. So that is what the most of the hard, uh, interventions are hard infrastructure centric and uh, relief measures, just the public distribution system and uh, um, uh, just to keep the people uh, uh, alive in terms of uh, uh, the rural employment guarantee scheme, cash transfers. And what is interesting uh, well, in the uh, recently, uh, which probably uh, Dr. Bashu will also appreciate that now uh, even the uh, concrete uh, uh, embankment has become a buzzword among the uh, local communities who are earlier not uh, really um, uh, asking for concrete embankment, they were asking for permanent embankment, but now their aspiration has shifted towards concrete. So it's like that the concrete is being equated with permanence. So that's a very, um, but, but it's really a kind of question which is looming large, whether the concrete is really the, the, the option considering the kind of changing river courses and uh, other issues which are, which are, are the, the prime um, problems in the region. Whereas the, the multi, uh, multiple the aid agencies like World Bank or ADB and conservation lobby, they have a very different uh, perception about this, uh, about this uh, area and they have the conservation focus in the area. So they are talking mostly about the managed retreat that is partial uh, relocation of the population uh, so that there'll be reduced dependence on, on forest uh, to, to reduce the conflict. So what we see uh, is uh, the kind of uh, two uh, uh, the kind of conflicts. On one hand, for revenue generation, a lot of uh, construction is happening in Sundarbon in terms of tourism, in terms of road infrastructure, uh, and also what we see here 
is the kind of erosion, which is also a continuous thing. So people are caught between uh, uh, two conflicting realities. One, one hand, there is a need for urge or quest for economic growth in the region for better livelihoods, whereas this area is an exceptional ecological value, uh, which, which is richest ecosystems of the world. So that is what bringing us to the uh, political and development narrative in last three decades, what we see in present situation that last three decades with the advent, with the, with the rising globalization and uh, the changing of societal aspirations or uh, improvement in connectivity or integration with market, the, the, the society, societal values have changed a lot. And which was earlier, which was a community which is, had a lot of good cohesive uh, forces and a lot of uh, shared uh, understanding about the forest, that is gradually being eroded. So that is one thing which is, uh, which is really uh, a concern. And on the other hand, the prevailing governance approach, what we see, uh, which is which uh, the term which I, pers I can use is called the governmentality, which is used by uh, French philosopher Michael Foucault in the, in the end of 1970s, which is more like a, a kind of a, a, a technocratic approach to uh, governance, which is more hard infrastructure centric, and uh, where community will be probably at the always at the receiving end, or also the which is probably a shrinking space of community to to uh, voice their opinion, and it is kind of uh, establishing a patron client relationship where government is like uh, giving uh, 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 delivering certain infrastructure, and uh, they are just the beneficiary uh, kind of uh, uh, syndrome. So this is. A situation where there are there is complexity of issues uh, because of uh, conservation issues because of uh, economic growth related aspirations and also there is there are diversity of desires from multiple occupations. So what uh, we personally I personally feel is that there is a need for paradigm change in the governance approach from governmentality or centralized kind of approach which is apparently rational but creating a kind of uh, multiplying the conflicts among the issues and the diversity of desires. So uh, that should actually lead to more towards community-led adaptation. Now, I do not mean that community-led adaptation is actually uh, replace some, uh, um, some, some uh, um, uh, um, macro-level policy issues, but I'm not touching today the macro-level policy issues or macro-level structural interventions, but I'd be primarily talking about the three uh, agenda or pathways towards community-led adaptation, which should be complementary to the uh, to the uh, macro-level governance. So uh, this I call it as pathways for community-led adaptation. So one is the first one is about decision making or planning uh, to understand the uh, the local problems, the community uh, problem analysis uh, by using. Uh, the different kind of participatory mapping tools to identify and assess the low problems from a local perspective, local community perspective, and local institutions perspective. And based on that, what will be the kind of development options and solutions? So that is one in terms of envisaging or understanding the problem and uh, finding out alternatives and through uh, community or engagement or community uh, or uh, collaborative engagement, which is actually uh, completely missing in present situation, in particularly in Indian uh, Sundarban. Second is, uh, which is very important in the community-led adaptation, is the resource allocation. And there, here we, we have in India uh, many southern states like Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and others. They're trying in rural governance and also in urban uh, governance. That's called participatory budgeting. It's like untied fund coming to the to the uh, place and the, the allocation is done by the based on community feedback or, or community uh, uh, requirement assessment. Uh, where where uh, Sundarban, I, as I understand now, almost 1,000 crore uh, is the kind of total all department budget in Indian Sundarban, but hardly anything comes to the community level to decide what kind of uh, allocation uh, needs uh, according to their uh, requirements. So, and finally, uh, mm, for community-led adaptation, uh, mm, Sundarban has a good uh, uh, legacy of uh, uh, mm, cooperatives. Like uh, even we had earlier the Goshaba cooperatives, which was uh, actually 
established by uh, Hamilton, the uh, uh, Britisher who came here. And also uh, in present context, we have many civil society organizations that are working in the cooperative sector. And we have a very good uh, uh, women group, which is uh, Sundarini uh, uh, Milk, uh, uh, the uh, cooperative. And there are uh, many forest eco-development committees in the forest. So for forest develop, uh, forest dependent communities, the EDCs can be the good entry point for strengthening and capacity building. And there are many SHGs. In fact, when I started the work in Sundarban, say 15, 20 years back, the SHGs were quite vibrant. But what I'm finding in last 20 years or two decades, as I told with the approach of governmentality, these SHGs have become just like an appendage or just like a dependent on the state for their uh, survival and for their uh, finding their market, which I think there's, there's a need to change that. Uh, so I just like to uh, conclude that, uh, um, that local communities are on the front lines of uh, climate change impacts. And these communities and also the local institutions, the rural institutions, the panchayats, uh, many uh, community-based institutions are there, including the uh, local women groups, they do not have much of a voice in the decisions that are affecting them, particularly in terms of the kind of uh, uh, development uh, model which is being, which is being uh, uh, actually uh, working over there. So there is a need to shift the kind of status quo from current top-down governmentality approach or hard infrastructure-centric approach towards community-led adaptation, which is actually a local uh, uh, local adaptation, where they will have greater uh, power and resources to for decision making and also the uh, to to uh, envisage the kind of uh, uh, future they like to have for them and for their next generation, so that we, the the development can shift the development model can shift from a, a kind of a linear progression towards more of a transformative resilience, which I think is the, is a main objective of uh, community-led adaptation. Instead of a linear uh, mm, approach, it would be more like an iterative and internalized approach. So I, I like to stop here and uh, would like to uh, listen to uh, other uh, participants and speakers and also for future questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Roy, for a very, very illuminating uh, presentation and you have really really thankful to you that you have really flagged on key points uh, uh, i really would like to kind of talk about that later but let us first hear the other opinions let let me go straight down to uh, professor andy large professor large is a professor of river science in newcastle university uk and is being part of a he's the principal investigator and director of, of a very important project of the living delta hub project i know closely that how well that is working so sometimes it's good to have a view from outside. Sometimes when we work, say Professor Roy said that he has been working there for two decades, people like us perhaps working there for a long, long time. Sometimes we kind of get strangled by the localities. So sometimes it's good to have a view from outside that kind of uh, shows certain things which we may not, we may be missing out inside. So over to, over to Professor Large uh, for, for your view and uh, really, really great to hear your views about Sundarban and adaptation. Over to Dr. Large. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Basu, and uh, thank you for the for the welcome today. And uh, uh, I would I would emphasize at the beginning I, I, I'm I'm actually actively working with a number of our, our speakers today, which is which is great because it does mean that we get that that local expertise. So uh, we're actually working with uh, with with uh, Shubhanich, Manoj, and Salim in terms of the speakers coming up. So which is, which is great. What what I want to briefly do is 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 just to very quickly give a a, a description of the Living Deltas Hub and, and and the work we're we're covering, but also to try and put that in some reflections from from COP twenty six to to try and bring the conversation on in terms of what uh, the the main challenges are coming up. Uh, the, living, the Living Delta uh, Del Delta's hub is a is a transdisciplinary hub. We, we, we work for a transformative change, so we have, have over twenty institutions uh, globally working from from ten countries uh, uh, for for this uh, for this agenda. Where we work is is in um, 
in the Ganges Brahmaputra Magna Delta in India and Bangladesh. Uh, so we're working on the Sundarbans World Heritage Site. In Vietnam, we're also working on the on the Red River Delta and, and also on the Mekong Delta. And then we have colleagues working further upstream in Cambodia too. Uh, so what we're also trying to do is, is recognize uh, that there is a need for transdisciplinary learning, uh, sorry, transboundary learning, uh, but also the, to reflect the fact that globally, uh, deltas are among, as, as Salim al Hook would say, the, the first climate change adapters. Uh, the, the, the people at the front line, and, and there's a lot that the world can learn from these people. And this is something that the hub is moving towards over our five year period. We've been quite poorly affected by COVID, as has everybody, uh, but we're now ready for two years, uh, quite intensive work in the next two years to, to achieve our objectives. So in, in effect, what are we dealing with? We're, we're dealing with uh, natural cultural heritage. This was a key driver of the, the hub as we formed it. We have many members on the hub who have been prominent members of previous Delta Consortia. Um, but no previous Delta Consortia has really emphasized natural cultural heritage as being a key sort of uh, focal point, a lens through which we view the future. And this is key when we as, see, as, as, as Dr. Basu said already, that the Sundarbans are one ecosystem. We need to therefore recognize that we need to develop from locally rooted knowledge because that underpins locally led adaptation. And importantly, we need to share co-created knowledge with communities. And again, Suvenich mentioned this in terms of trying to get more horizontal uh, power relationships rather than rather than vertical in terms of transboundary sharing that is, that is that is very important so we're trying to do that in the hub and we're dealing with a range of different aspects this diagram simply shows the visual minutes from a a, a, a um, previous uh, project which, which is still just just completing a newton funded project on ecological resilience of the Indo Indian Sundarban. But we had uh, the key point there was that we just weren't restricting ourselves to Indian delegates. We were having early career researchers from India and Bangladesh, because this is one ecosystem with a range of different social ecological aspects to it. And key in that is listening to the voices of the Delta. So this is sort of reflected the, the range of discussions that we had in a in a, in a room in Newcastle, we couldn't travel to the Sundarbans because of COVID, I'm afraid, but we, we did the best we could and we had virtual plenaries and uh, brought everybody together and, and we'll be working forward for ecological resi resilience. So key questions we need to ask are, are, how are the deltas changing? What are the key drivers of change and, and what are the consequences of that change? We've seen already that the mention of that, that sort of significant sea level rise figure, the difficulties, in fact, the impossibility of moving people in significant numbers. And therefore, what are the consequences of change, not just for those communities, but for the governance aspects for, for deltas? We know already that we're living in altered systems. This is this is Vietnam, where the traditional statement of living with, with floods is now changed to a new sort of motto almost of living with floods, brackish water and salt water, reflecting that saline intrusion is changing the very basis on which traditional Delta livelihoods and even more, more re recent ones decades wise in terms of uh, the, the, the rapid increase in rice and shrimp, et cetera, uh, in terms of agricultural initiatives, these are changing all the time. And they're changing because we're seeing huge biodiversity loss on these deltas and climate change is altering the rules of everything uh, that we work under. So in terms of looking for Delta futures and transformative futures, we need to learn from live, livelihood experiences across uh, the deltas. And this is what we're doing in, in Vietnam, in India and Bangladesh. We're seeking to work with delta communities to build more adaptive futures with them and not for them. We're, we're seeking to really base our, our, our understanding uh, on, on local locally rooted knowledge. But as Salim al Hook would say that that Focus on adaptation was not a COP26 outcome. Again, it was business as usual in many ways. There was a very disappointing outcome for adaptation in terms of the argument between mitigation and adaptation, the amount of global finance that, that moves towards uh, mitigation rather than adaptation. And there's a real need therefore to, to redress that balance. I'm sure Salim will talk in much more knowledgeable terms about that coming up. So I won't dwell on that one. Capacity strengthening, that's been mentioned already today. Um, 
in terms of working with communities that the hub seeks to work with the most vulnerable and marginalized communities and, and following again the SDG agenda of, of no one being left behind. But again, as we know, that was not a very good COP26 outcome. The 48, you know, most uh, um, less developed countries uh, left Glasgow feeling rather let down in terms of, of the, the way the agenda had panned out in, in favor of the, the geopolitics of large scale announcements from that, from that, uh, that forum. And raising the voices of the Delta dwellers, which is a key aspect of what we do in the hub, was not a cop out to a 26 outcome. The voices of, of the people who are at the front line of climate change were, were, were kept muted at Glasgow. And, and this is something that hopefully the COP27, which is based in Africa, in Egypt, will, will be able to sort of redress slightly. In terms of uh, moving forward, equi equitable partnerships are, are, are key. Uh, for for uh, transformative Delta futures. Again, those equitable partnerships, as I've just illustrated, were not a, really a, a COP26 outcome. So locally led adaptation is, is a key way forward. We need to see that um, Delta dwellers as the, amongst the first climate change adapters. We need to see them as the next generation of global leaders. Um, being able to sort of translate experiences to other countries because for example in Britain we have low-lying landscapes which are a distinct threat from climate change but we don't learn from anywhere else in the world and we need to do that so locally led adaptation is key again this has been uh, mentioned already in term, terms of some of the approaches in terms of uh, large-scale changes I think Suvenich mentioned this in terms of of, of some of the the, the, the mitigation if, if changes are, for example, when we get an impact, we tend to get uh, a precautionary approach, an intervention which is large scale to manage risk uh, uh, over the whole project life. And an example would be that sea, that sea wall. But we need to move towards more adaptive ways of managing uh, these landscapes. A number of inventions over interventions over time, properly scaled solutions, uh, also based on 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 locally led knowledge. That that's an, that's an absolute must. And there are emerging principles for this. Again, I'm sure Salim will, will talk about these, but we're, we're, we're getting quite involved in these in the hub in terms of how we can move our agenda. The, the advantage of a, of a research hub of our scale and size is that we can begin to take account of emerging uh, narratives and, and, and uh, agendas and begin to, to bring our, our critical mass to, to bear in terms of trying to have some impact on that. And so we're getting involved with ICAD, for example, in terms of the, the, the principles for locally led ad adaptation. And I won't go into those ones, but a key one is the one on the top left there, devolving decision making to the lowest appropriate level. That underpins everything else in the other eight and in, in the other seven. It's ex extremely important. So in those principles, the hub is working on across scales. We're looking at ecosystem services, otherwise known as nature's life support systems, and the way that those underpin products and processes on the deltas and how that might change in terms of climate change and those pressures. We're involved in mangrove restoration across uh, our, our study areas in terms of monitoring and quantifying landscape scale losses aligning restoration with sustainable agricultural practice, recognizing that it's not a matter of simply replanting, that we have to recognize that natural cultural heritage is changing all the time and that we need to build in initiatives with, with, with those moving agendas. We're working on food systems and security. And again, this is extremely important with the pressures that the Sundarbans are under in terms of the need for more sustainable agriculture and aquaculture. These are um, shrimp ponds, uh, and, and when these go in, that's the end of the Delta's landscape in terms of, of, a, of a cultural system in that sense, but also the, the, the rich biodiversity, as you can see, suffers badly. And we're looking at climate change resilient organic farming as a key uh, a, a part of our activity going forward. We're looking at vulnerability and risk. We're, we're, we're again looking at livelihood choices uh, across our four Delta social ecological systems. We're modeling risk, and we're also looking at the costs of that in terms of cost-benefit analysis of different approaches, because uh, if, if governments, um, whether large G or small G, um, think that things are, are, are not a cost-benefit, then, then it's extremely hard to get that policy underway. And key for that, then, is, is communication from the outset with Delta dwellers and with policymakers alike on an equ equitable footing to, 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 to deal with these shared 
wicked problems of climate change. So we're looking at science of the deltas. We're, we're putting in uh, new monitoring where monitoring wasn't there. We're looking at capacity strengthening where monitoring is, is, is current. We're looking at expanding monitoring through community-based science. So, so working with communities to, to understand their environments, the, the local ponds, et cetera, the groundwater. Um, but on a larger scale, for example, the Indian Shun demands are, are very poorly monitored and that's hopefully one legacy of our hub activity will be a, a program in place. We're looking at, again, at principles in terms of youth and gender and identifying the next generation of leaders, particularly in terms of climate change. And then the whole hub agenda, along with the other 11 GCRF hubs, is underpinned by the, the UNDP and the Sustainable Development Goals. We're seeking to localise the SDGs, to build partnerships for the goals, and this is extremely important. If we take the um, hitherto for view of the SDGs where society and economy are neatly nested in a, in a sort of warm and uh, welcoming environment, we know that that is not happening in our, in our world today. Um, and where partnerships are sort of things that come out of all of that sort of nested approach, that's the Stockholm Resilience Centre. We take an alternative view where we need to underpin a resilient biosphere through better, more equitable societies, more circular economies at scale, and that's extremely important to bear in mind. We need to build the partnerships from the outset between policymakers, academics, NGOs, communities, uh, and, 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 and global funders to build better partnerships and, and, and only then will we begin to move towards more uh, resilient biospheres. We won't get that as a sort of bottom ring of the wedding cake where, where society and economy sits in that. It, it, it just will not happen. So we need the, the partnerships. SDG 17 is, is a key one. And there is an 18th SDG in my view that's missing, which is culture. Because without an appreciation of culture and place and a sense of place, um, sustainability is extremely hard to achieve. Uh, and my final slide then is, is, is trying to build it all together. We know there are compounding risks of climate change and socioeconomic development in, in the Shundaban. We know that there are urgent challenges for the lives and livelihoods and for the land and water resources of the Shundaban. We know that the human resources and the capacities in those delta landscapes need maintaining and strengthening. And we argue that the solutions must be cultural heritage sensitive and they must be devolved to the lowest possible level as soon as possible. In terms of that nexus of land, water, energy and food, we need action to better understand the drivers and the spatial temporal dynamics of change. What's, what timescales are we anticipating this change if we're thinking about moving anybody, never mind 1.5 million people? if we're thinking at 25% of the population. We need that monitoring in place and scenario development so that we can begin to translate what's happening on the deltas and in the Sundavans in particular. So we need a systems perspective across the current boundary between India and Bangladesh, recognizing we are dealing with one ecosystem to look at predicted drives of change on that ecosystem, to look at trade-offs and synergies and to support holistic planning across both countries for resilient and adaptive Delta futures in the Sundaban. And that in effect needs co-created people-centered solutions, addressing the needs and aspirations of those who live on those deltas. So we need increased data, data sharing from the outset between governments, agencies, funding organizations, and scientists. We need better open access mechanisms to make findings more accessible and impactful. We need better frameworks, decision support tools, but also action-oriented research with the clearly identified beneficiaries of that evidence-based policy. And my final point is that dialogue is key and the equitable collaboration is a key because these are involving the global first adapters and that's critical for building resilience too and planning for, for climate change. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lodge, for the wonderful, wonderful presentation. Really, really uh, thankful for the presentation. Uh, I, I am sure that we'll be discussing uh, major pointers later, but the major takeaways from me are three points. One is the transboundary initiative we have been talking about. I think uh, that's an extremely important uh, component because of the lopsided proportionality of impacts of Sundarban in India and Bangladesh. 
In India, Sundarban is just a very small component and often doesn't get the importance at the central level. In Bangladesh, it's extremely important, major contributor in GDP. So that's much more important. So how we can actually balance this and have a combined voice. When you look at Africa, 15 countries talking together about Africa. But in Sundarban, we are not talking together. So that's a very important point. We should discuss this later. Another is ecosystem services. And if we talk about ecosystem services, then the people who are there should be ecosystem warriors. So if, if Shundarban is providing ecosystem services to rest up uh, the West Bengal and also in Bangladesh, what they are getting in return. So that's extremely important part. The third point you mentioned about the culture, the importance of recognizing culture vis-a-vis -vis SDG 17. Often we miss out this small cogs in the wheel. We, we, dominate, we look at the dominating physical adaptation measures, but we tend to kind of go beyond this smaller points, which is extremely important as well. So thank you for raising this. We'll be discussing it. Thank you. So uh, without much ado, I, I just go over to uh, Professor uh, Salimul Hawk now. Professor Hawk needs no introduction and one of the one of the major voices that I already said. Professor Hawk is the director, International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, professor of Independent University of Bangladesh. And I'm sure that he's going to talk about Bangladesh Shundarban, but I'm really very really keen to know from him that uh, in, in, in context of the COP26 and kind of a bit of a bit of a uh, enlargement of the Global Adaptation Fund, how it is uh, possible to link that fund to the adaptation processes in Bangladesh and, Shundar and India. Over to Professor Hawk. Thank you very much, uh, Jayantha, and uh, thank you to IMPRI for organizing this important event and inviting me. Uh, so let me start with um, a quick reflection on COP26, which from my perspective was a very bad COP uh, because it did not rise to the challenge of the existential threat that loss and damage is now happening because of climate change. Not going to happen, is already happening. In the last few days, uh, three cyclones in succession have hit the island of Madagascar and the country of Mozambique, one after the other within a matter of days. The UK just had a big cyclone hurricane as well. So everywhere is seeing this now. It is inevitable. Um, and the COP26 leaders uh, decided to ignore it. So in, my, in that sense, a bad cop. On the other hand, not to be totally negative, there were some positives that came out and I think we need to build on that. The first positive was a recognition that there had not been enough investment in adaptation and that there needs to be a lot more. The developed countries offered to double their funding for adaptation, which is a good thing. Um, they also have to make it more effective, which they have not done in the past. So that is something that we will be definitely looking at in terms of how effectively they use that money to go to the most vulnerable. And the past uh, experience does not bode well unless they recognize their mistakes and uh, improve their performance. And at the same time, there was a big... Uh, new initiative, I won't say brand new, but relatively new initiative on nature-based solutions, um, which is very relevant for our discussion in the context of the Shundarbans and Bangladesh and India. So I uh, agree with everything that has already been said by the various speakers. I won't repeat any of them. Uh, they are all very learned people. They know much more than I do about the uh, details and the nitty gritty. So what I will offer are three <clears throat> forward-looking viewpoints uh, in terms of how do we overcome the barriers that we know exist? Uh, how do we tackle the problems that are getting worse, not getting better? And so uh, we need to think out of the box. Business as usual has not worked. So we need to think out of the box. So I'll start with a couple of things that we are doing, as you know, we organize a platform called Gobeshana uh, for non-Bangla speakers. That's a Bangla word for uh, research. It's a big platform in Bangladesh now with over 50 universities. We have international universities as well. So I'll invite my colleagues from India uh, to join up. 
And uh, although we started off as a Bangladeshi uh, um, platform of research NGOs and universities, we have now broadened it to a global platform uh, on locally led adaptation in particular. And this happened last year because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, we used to have an in-person conference at my university in Dhaka for many years. Because of COVID, we couldn't do that. So we went virtual. And by virtue of going virtual, we also went global. And we had uh, uh, sessions from all over the world. We ran it 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days. We had nearly 100 sessions from all over the world. And we have had a, such a good success that we are now going to stay that way. Even after COVID restrictions are over, we are not going to the in-person conference modality anymore. We are staying virtual. And the next conference is going to be from the 27th of March. And I'm sure uh, there will be quite a few sessions on Shundarbans and deltas already. Uh, we've already invited uh, session organizers. If any of you are interested and you have not sent in uh, a session uh, application, please do so very quickly. I'm sure we will be able to accommodate it. Um, and that will bring together people who are working at local level. The, for, the, the emphasis is on local voices, local adapters who already know what they're doing, are doing adaptation, and we need to learn from them and then see how we can help them uh, from the outside. We are outsiders. They are the people who are bearing the brunt of the impacts, and we need to learn from them. That is our uh, global uh, uh, conference. Incidentally, the theme of this year's conference is how do we uh, connect the local to the global, not just you know going to the COP and doing a side event, which is what most people do, but actually influencing the decision making at the COP, which we don't do. Uh, we are outsiders in the COP process. How, how do we become better at being insiders? That's the, the question that we want to uh, challenge ourselves to. And the outcome of the Gobeshna conference is what do we want to see in COP27 and how do we make it happen? Not go to Sharm el Sheikh and do a side event. That does not do anything except you know, a little bit of networking, which is good, but it has no influence whatsoever on the process. The process has already started. In fact, um, I tell people who are interested in influencing the COP, don't go to the COP. Go to the SB meeting in Germany in June where the agenda for the COP is going to be set in motion and put in place. If you can influence the SB decision, then you have already influenced the COP decision because going to the COP, you don't have much scope to change what the SB, the subsidiary bodies have already set in motion. So going to Germany for the SB is actually much more tactically better if you want to influence the COP. It, the other advantage of that is that it is not a huge meeting like the COP is, and you have the opportunity to actually meet negotiators, talk to them, have a cup of coffee with them, which in the COP is impossible. You hardly meet anybody. It's such a big jamboree. So we will be doing that. So we are going to be focusing on actually influencing the decision in COP27 from these local adapters from all over the world, not just from our part of the world. That's number one. Number two, I think th there's an opportunity here uh, for all of us on this call and all of our colleagues to join forces and be better at getting messages across to decision makers. But I, I would say, in addition to advocating for uh, you know, politicians and, and leaders, in your case, national as well as uh, 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 central leaders, as well as uh, provincial leaders in, in uh, West Bengal, in our case, national leaders and local leaders in Kulna, uh, is that we also need to be better organized as civil society, as researchers, as academics, and as media. I think we, we don't do a good enough job of uh, connecting ourselves across the border that divides us. Uh, many of you are Bengali speakers. Amra, Apar Bangla, Apar Bangla, Amra, Akshate Kachkurte Parbukina, Eta Hachamar Prosna, Ami Monekuri Korajabe. So let us think about how can we be more effective in joining forces ourselves and seeing how we can be better at getting the changes that we need 
to have happen and get the decision makers who have to make those changes to make those decisions themselves. And my final point is actually what keeps me uh, going and, and optimistic despite all the pessimism and, and uh, negative activities and uh, you know actions, the climate actions that are happening and the lack of actions by politicians that are uh, facing them uh, is that my faith is in the next generation. And you know, they are an untapped force of phenomenal power uh, that both sides of the border we have. Young girls and young boys are our foundational puji amader puji amra we give them the wrong kind of education and they become kormochari and white collar jobs and so on that's the wrong kind of education we need to be educating girls and boys and i emphasize girls more than boys because educating girls has a multiplier effect in terms of benefits to society many times educating boys educate boys is good for them they have a good career they make money uh, but educate a girl and then you know it's better for society she will look after children she will look after the society before she looks after herself and if we can change the education system which is in our hands we're educators let us see if we can use the uh, the location of the Shundarban that cuts across the border in India and Bangladesh to work with the schools, work with the colleges, work with the young girls and boys and give them a different kind of education <clears throat> and make them into climate champions, not victims. The victimhood narrative we should give away. It's no longer a valid narrative. We must um, strive for leadership narrative. We can solve the problem. We can deal with the problem. We can be better at doing it not only for ourselves in our part of the world, for the whole world, for the rest of the world, they can learn from us and we can teach them if we, could, if we do it right. And I do believe we can do it right. And if we do it wrong, then we we'll lose a generation of young people. They will be miseducated like we have been miseducated in our generation. We, we must not let that happen again. We have a very, very thriving, and this is not a division. It's not between India and Bangladesh, it's both of us. Your children, your young people, our young people, all of them, the education we need to give to them is the same education. We don't need alada alada kuridorkarnai. So I really do want us to think about how do we instill a new kind of education, starting with the universities where we are, many of us are professors, we are familiar with that territory, but it's a very difficult thing to change. Universities are very ossified structures, you know, they don't like changing. But let us see if we can change them. And then at the college level, and then at the high school level, and even at the primary school level. But the important thing is not so much the curriculum, but how we instill a thirst for knowledge, uh, an, an ability in the students, the inherent ability of the students, which we actually drum out of them. The way we teach them to pass exams and, and rote learning, it drums out of them all the creativity they had. The point that Andy made about culture. To me, that's culture. That's our kids. They, they, we need to make them a more cultured citizens of uh, their own countries, but cultured citizens of the world at the same time. So let me, let me leave that thought uh, with all of you uh, to see whether we might be able to come up with some ideas in our own place, how we can do it, and then linking up with each other and with others, how we can make it a much bigger movement uh, than it is. Uh, just let me um, end by saying, I've been in touch with the Fridays for Future young kids. You know, they, they go on strike every Friday and they will, they, I have persuaded them uh, to launch a campaign for raising funds for loss and damage, the victims of loss and damage. And they will do that. And I've asked all the school kids from all over the world, it doesn't matter which country they come from, rich or poor, to donate their lunch money to a fund for loss and damage. Every child will come out of school, not immediately, this, they will plan it for a little while, but in the coming months, they will have a, a special Friday for funding loss and damage. And every school child will give their lunch money, contribute it to a fund for the victims of loss and damage. The leaders are not doing anything, but let the children shame the leaders into taking action. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Professor Hogg. As usual, a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Not only wonderful presentation, I think you have opened up uh, the direction to respond to the situation. And that's more important. We uh, often talk about the, uh, the off-repeated problems and all these things, but to come out of the solution, at least showing the options on table is very important. And I'm really thankful to you for putting up a lot of options on table and, and to respond to that. Uh, two, three points are extremely important. You spoke about a nature-based solution in, in Shundarban, I think extremely important. Definitely we'll be discussing it later. You also talked uh, about uh, leadership. I think, again, a very important component. I think leadership gives you a sense of ownership and also a sense of kind of a resilience. When you are talking about that we are all losers, uh, people also tend to think in that manner. I have seen uh, uh, somebody in Bangladesh that how he's building up his own uh, kind of small house once it being washed out and he's fine. He said, okay, it has happened. Okay, let me respond to it. So I think this, this are, I'm talking about Goramara Island in, in, in close to Shagar Island in, uh, in Indian Sundarbans. And during the Yas cyclone, almost the entire kind of island gone, washed, washed away. They came back and have this Durga Puja next night. So that talks about the resilience. So really, really wonderful. I think this leadership concept of yours is extremely important. And, and, and definitely we'll be going back to that. Uh, I'm really looking forward to further response from you later in the, uh, in the day. But as of now, let me go over to Professor Monoj Roy. Professor Roy is the Assistant Professor in Sustainability, Lancaster University, UK. Uh, Professor Roy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, um, Jant uh, and uh, all the speakers who has uh, eloquently explained uh, both very rich detail about the situation on the ground, as well as some of the very global uh, global thinking. Um, so it's like Professor Hawk was really, you know, uh, asking for educating the, the future generation. I'm sort of in, you know, still in that bracket, you know. Uh, so. I'll be talking more of question rather than sort of uh, and trying to put some answer to all these big questions being asked. So first of the things uh, I was trying to sort of really reflect on our role in this whole debate. What are we able to or are doing? Conceptually, we are actually research activists. We kind of go there, we're trying to promote responses as well as document success and failures and try to even taking Andy's um, you know, discussion about trying to make scenarios, try to understand the pathway, whose directions we are going. So we are doing two things together. We're doing research, but more importantly, we are also catalyzing, catalyzing activism. Now, when we actually talk in that sense of activism, you know, conducting activism, then comes the question of, are we able to produce what is needed to change on the ground? And that is what this big idea of politics comes in. And Shogun was mentioning some of the you know, uh, established thinker about, about governmentality, the politics and the, this. But I think if we go back and sort of really ask, what is politics or what is politics made out of? Is it a really bad thing? Or is it something can we escape? Now, in our role as research activists, we cannot often engage with politics. Politics needs an issue, and politics needs an issue to be made to the public. So it needs a public, and it needs an issue. So at the moment, we can see that we are, Dr. Selimul Huck's uh, uh, thinking that we are sort of good at, you know, trying to do side events in COP. And, and if you kind of see what COP is, it's almost like a binary, binary of delegates uh, from the global south and then big powerful uh, you know, delegates from the global north. It's often a very, very difficult conversation goes on. But the, the greater public on the ground, the politics uh, on the ground uh, is not played at, at this big event here, international politics are played. Now I'm very excited with this idea of locally led adaptation because it brings politics to where it matters. Now, if we actually think from a research activist level, 
we may sometimes be at risk of mistaking the ground politics because we need to create the issue that we are talking about, we are concerned about on the ground. People need to come really situating that issue in the public domain. They need to cluster around the issues that is on there. And that is where I think, you know, local elite adaptation brings a lot of prospect. But this also has a lot of challenges. Again, that's what I was meaning to uh, ask the more question than the answer. So one of the question to me is that, how do we actually mediate this politics formation? Now mediation uh, has many different roles, but most important role is that it will address the conflict. Okay, so we know that we have got government, and in this case, we have government both in Bangladesh and India. They have their own political ideology of how things should work and who should be allowed to live. That is like necropolitics, this new idea being uh, in a coin is that who is allowed to die, who is allowed to suffer from the politics that has been played. And that is a government politics. But we want to need to sort of make politics issue based. And many of the issues that Shobunik pointed at is develop, developmental issues. So if we actually can do development in a better way, many of these problems probably would be solved. So we are actually going back to the same circle of doing development better. And that then actually helps us doing adaptation better. Now on this point, when you are actually talking about development, there is this another question. What we have seen in Bangladesh in some of the cyclones that, you know, hot showing shows that there is a demand for now concrete embankment. In Bangladesh, we had urban embankment that was doing a good job, but it was not maintained properly. It was not maintained, it was leaked through to bringing the uh, hot and it shows the saline water to help the shrimp farming um, within the protected uh, you know, areas. So that comes that the, the governance or the mediation has two different roles. On the one hand, constantly revitalize the issue, constantly revitalize the collective around those issues that need addressing, but also really maintaining a system of depreciation and replenishment. So depreciation is a really the economic term and it's always very, you can see that very established in well-performing businesses. But if we come into the, our landscapes, we do not actually you know, pay attention to that. Things that we put on the ground are being used. And, and that's why they are utility, uh, they are uh, you know, use value, is getting uh, you know down so we need to sort of really pump in sort of to replenish what is being used and we do not see this happen i think this depreciation and repl replenishment could be you know could be considered quite a sort of technical term but i think this locally led adaptation is bringing even more broader terms that salimul hawk has, has already mentioned about the young generation okay so this young generation need to be educated, to be appreciating what is going on in the society, but more importantly, they're being asked to contribute back to the society. And then the local led adaptation, how local could we go? And then how do we actually get these things, you know, done and implemented within the local system? And there needs to be a systematic way of, you know, financing, replenishing, replenishing and so forth, it goes on. It does not end in a limited, uh, in a uh, sort of electoral cycle period. It needs to go on. Yes, I think I, I would like to sort of really finish by asking another question really, is that this COP and the global debates where we see a wrangling between the delegates from the global North and global South, um, but how could we actually bring the local politics formation into it. How do we see that the issue um, is formed on the ground and raised and, and then really created a, a situation whereby the global leaders cannot uh, escape uh, meeting this one? My question is that if global is too big to realize, 
should we not really think about this local led adaptation also has a big role to actually support the politics formation. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Rai. It's extremely important points you raised about the politics. Yes, I think Sundarbans is a lot about politics. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting to find, at least in the Indian part of Sundarbans, uh, there's a very uh, clear difference between the Indian Sundarbans and Bangladesh Sundarbans. In Bangladesh Sundarbans, people live around Sundarbans. They are dependent on Sundarbans, but they are not really part of Sundarbans in that way the Indian Sundarbans is. In Indian Sundarbans, you crisscross between a wild island and a human habitat island. So in Indian Shandarban, as because perhaps due to the kind of island structure, uh, you never you will not find a more heterogeneous political spread the Shandarban has like the other parts of West Bengal. That's a very, a very, very important point. I'm thankful to you that you've raised it because unless we take into account that kind of heterogeneity and political process, I think to, to put the local, local adaptations on, on ground is very difficult. And you also mentioned the importance of linking with the locally led adaptations with the political process. Extremely important because of the panchayati art system that we have, and, and we need to integrate that. I think extremely, extremely important point. So uh, I, I now would like to go over to the presentation that we are supposed to have. I think Dr. Upashana Ghosh and Dr. Debojiti Dash, uh, they are going to uh, make a joint presentation. It's about 10 minutes because after that, then we'll have a discussion within the uh, panelists and then over, over to the kind of open open discussion, open floor discussion. So very quickly, Dr. Debojiti Dash and uh, Dr. Upashana Ghosh for your presentation. Floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Basu. So um, let me share my screen. So is it visible? Yes, we can see it. Ma'am, you can also go full screen. Yes, just a second. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Imri, uh, to invite me to speak about our projects in Sundarbans. And definitely, um, I will not repeat those words which uh, my stalwart seniors has already been uh, discussed. So uh, let me just define that what uh, where we where we uh, left the discussions few minutes back uh, by uh, Dr. Roy and uh, Dr. Basu. That there is a difference between India and Bangladesh Sundar means. So in Bangladesh Sundar means the reserve forest, but in India, so uh, it means the entire reserve forest incorporating the human settlements. So in Bangladesh, it is an ecologically critical area, and there is no buffer zone uh, in the country in India. So in Bangladesh also, it's predominantly by, inhabited by the rural population, whereas the Indian part of Sundarbans, it's urban and rural, and there is a, a you know, close impact of globalization. So which is the climate change impact, which is the globalization impacts, these are very overlapped in Indian part of Sundarbans. So, but basically in terms of policy making, this is very important because there is no def definite unified landscape of Sundarbans. Uh, the, uh, so far the Delta is concerned. So uh, if, if we look about, if you talk about the uh, locally laid adaptations to climate change, uh, not about what the COP26 has said, but we need to have a close, close um, uh, view of the, the, the people, the culture, and what they are living, lived experience of everyday life. So definitely this situation, this uh, entire society of Sundarbans is, this uh, is, uh, uh, you know, it is in transition. So the first, they were a self-sufficient economy, now they are more to a market dependent one. 
So there is a transition from the farmers fishers to wage laborer because most of them had to migrate because of the dwindling of the uh, uh, traditional agric agricultural livelihood and they have to migrate to other uh, places. In Bangladesh, it is uh, from Shundarbans to Dhaka. Uh, and in uh, Indian part, it is uh, from the uh, rural Sundarbans to the other states of the, uh, of, uh, the country. So the basically the transitions from the fruit producer to fruit consumers is a big change. That is one reason definitely climate change. The other reason is definitely the overlapping globalizations. There is a continuous mobile population between two countries and uh, legal, illegal. There are a lot of issues regarding their political boundary. Uh, there is a transition also in the nature worship to the mainstream religion because uh, during my research also I have seen or we are still discussing with the people that Bone Bibi, the cult of Bone Bibi is basically uh, losing a hard uh, a stronghold because the people's shifting, the, the nature-based relationship is shifting towards a casual laboring. So people are trained to get um, involved more with uh, the mainstream religions, both the Hindus and Muslims in, in, in the both Indian and Bangladesh part. So this is another important uh, transitions and uh, definitely uh, the, the, the locally laid adaptations have a lot of implications uh, within this context. So this population, basically the Sundarbans populations are trapped between the rural and urban life dynamics. As I mentioned, the Indian part of Sundarbans, the main town, Kolkata, is only 150 uh, kilometer, and, and the urbanization process is increasing uh, towards the Sundarbans. So these dynamics are making people in a transition, making the society of Sundarbans in transitions, and uh, the people are kind of perplexed, uncertain to how to behave, and what to adopt and how to adopt. So there are major initiatives for transformation, uh, both India and Bangladesh. Uh, so it's a uh, salinity resistant crops, backlash aquaculture, crab uh, cultivations, training for girls and women's alternatives, livelihoods. So I'm not gonna go for details in it, but there are some sustainability uh, components uh, in each of this initiative, adaptation initiatives because most of them are based on the traditional local knowledge and practice. So it has the potential to create alternatives, potential resource to uh, distribute across the various sections of the communities. It is, in many case, cases, it is gender inclusive because uh, it's one of the big reason is um, the women who are, who are present within the islands and they are due to the patriarchal norm, they are not going out, uh, from the, uh, out of the Sundarbans. So, but however, uh, in our research project also, uh, we are still yet to understand that how transformative and how resilient, uh, how uh, sustainable is this initiatives are. So uh, regarding the voices of the community, uh, we, in both of our projects, uh, so presently we are doing two projects in Sundarbans, both India and Bangladesh. Combinedly, it's a transboundary project. Uh, Dr. Huck is, uh, I mean, ICAD is one of the uh, partner of uh, in both the projects. So uh, definitely one is tapestry lead by um, uh, Professor Laila Mehta from University of Sussex. And definitely other one is the SSRC project, so, which is, uh, Debojuti will talk about, uh, talk more about that. So in, in both the project, uh, we are doing, uh, we are trying to, uh, do some um, participatory action research and one major te technique we are using is the photo voice. So uh, we, we are especially focusing on the women who are left behind due to uh, certain patriarchal rules and other their caregiving rules because now the women of Sundarbans in both the countries have the triple kind of a burden. They have to look after the children, they have to look after the uh, restoring the livelihood process, and as well as the uh, you know little bit of leftover uh, agricultural processes in, um, or agricultural land uh, the families have within the Sundarbans. So we gave digital cameras to those women uh, to, to capture their livelihood challenges, their, uh, the, any challenges they faced. Uh, we have not guided them because it is a participatory technique. And they basically, they wanted to expo express the voices that how the climate change impacts are um, impacting their children. 
So the mothers, um, we try to uh, uh, do be our best to capture it, uh, capture the, all the intersections of the society. Uh, the crab and fish collectors, uh, the, the families who lived on the embankments, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, uh, women-headed households, uh, which is a new emergent uh, of uh, in the Sundarbans uh, social settings, and community with large agricultural land. So in uh, the similar project in Bangladesh, maybe Devajuti will talk about more. I'm just focusing on the Indian part of Sundarbans. So there were uh, um, totally about uh, 87 co-researchers so far. Uh, we call them co-researchers, the mothers, the, uh, the very young mothers, uh, work together to capture the issues which are impacting their children. So uh, just these are some pictures uh, which the mothers came up with us. We never focused on the how uh, the, they capture the photos, uh, what, is, what is there is any uh, clarity in the picture. No, we, we never uh, thought of in this line, but we just wanted to capture the issues. We just wanted to capture their voices. So uh, as you see, that's, you know, fish catch is declining. Uh, my husband is migrated, so I have to go to the quarks. So there are, there are issues like this, the women have captured, um, leaving the smaller children uh, to, to the relatively uh, bigger one is uh, because the mother has to go for the crack collections is another issue. And of course, as an adaptation process, they are trying their best to uh, plant the mangrove to the support of the environments. So all these issue, issues they have captured and we facilitate our kind of platforms, uh, policy platforms uh, to negotiate with the local decision makers because that is the one of the major component of photo voice participatory action research. So the mothers themselves, they presented and they negotiated uh, with the negotiated with the uh, local policymakers like Panchayat Pradhan uh, and the Panchayat members, the local health, uh, the medical, uh, uh, I mean, um, professionals, to how to how to uh, you know come up with a mutually agreeable solutions uh, for their problems. So. Uh, but this process is still going on, so uh, I cannot say that and what, what are the impacts, so we yet to discuss, we yet to uh, find out that, and uh, in both the projects, the, the photo voice is going on, but the many interesting things has also come up that where, where the mothers couldn't say that, the mother said that they couldn't capture, I mean, the one big issue is the domestic violence. Domestic violence, we know that's the livelihood uncertainty has put a kind of a pressure, mental pressure to the, to the, uh, to the couples, to the uh, entire family. So, and, and in this four week situations, definitely the increased rate of violence, domestic violence or the criminal activities or uh, the woman abuse is really an uh, increasing factor. And uh, so as the trafficking and uh, early uh, girl uh, marriages, the marriages of the girl uh, child. So this issues uh, the mother said that they couldn't capture because they didn't understand uh, that what to capture in this uh, process, in this uh, issue, within these issues. But however, they, they told us uh, during the discussions, during the debriefing sessions that these are, um, these are also the important factors for their life, which has a deep root in the climate change uncertainties. So interestingly, it's a kind of giving a voice. The voice maybe uh, you know, Dr. Huck was just mentioning uh, because um, these are the mothers who have the young children. So we try to kind of giving them a platform, giving them a voice to say about their things. And uh, they, they always said that, you know, after, after the photo voice project uh, one sessions, we asked them, how do you feel? So the first thing they said that I feel like I'm doing a man's job. Because saying something about uh, about themselves or the community is always a man's job. So here, the they they found the woman found um, a shift in the gender role. So they uh, also said that uh, they they have a kind of a realization that they can also do something. And Sundarbans women are very very aspirational, and we all agree to that. So. This kind of initiatives, uh, we may need to voice the local adaptations, uh, voicing the local adaptation processes um, in, in the near future that we were discussing about the COP26. 
so if we just Dr. this Ghosh, if you this, can if you can wind up this quickly. points already been this so yes yes so yeah so one last thing i would like to mention here that uh, in both the project in and in my both project tapestry and ssrc projects we are trying our best to have the trans boundary learning because as we already discussed that india and bangladesh they do not uh, have a platform to discuss so maybe this kind of opportunities uh, have uh, this kind of platforms have opportunities to uh, discuss the trans boundary issues mutual learning and maybe a maybe a possible solutions uh, for the sundarbans i would end here thank you so much thank you uh, dr go sorry to kind of have to stop you because uh, we have to go ahead with the other That's part fine. of it but i i really would like to add a point uh, i think very important uh, discussion especially in context of transboundary but you said that there has been no platform uh, for transboundary work which i think not exactly the case no not uh, not, a, not uh, a political or formal uh, platform yes the formal platform is there it is called biisrci bangladesh india sundarban regional initiative it's a platform where number of organizations from india and bangladesh are attached world bank is attached it's a formal platform uh, may not be having the reaching the status it should have been but there's there's some formality into it so just would like to up, upgrade here uh, that there is some some interaction being going on but i'm i'm definitely agreeable with you that the platform needs to be much more horizontal Absolutely. must include Absolutely. other that players other stakeholders that that's the point okay uh, before i start the dialogue with the panelists uh, may i may i ask uh, dr mehta that uh, do we need to strictly adhere to the time or we will be ist in indian stretchable time so can we can we kind of uh have five or 10 minutes more than the schedule let let because accordingly we'll proceed dr mehta dr mehta are you there anyway i think uh, uh let's start the discussion uh, i think extremely important points came out from the whole uh, deliberation uh i start with a point and i would like all the panelists uh, who like to respond to that migration as an adaptation strategy i think that's an extremely important point before covid struck uh, a large majority of experts used to think that migration in sundarban is really really working as an adaptation strategy and uh, various uh, works in recent times i i was involved in the migration work about a, about a month back there's a uh, south asian report coming up with migration in sundarban is part of that that 70% families have at least 1% migrated out of sundarban that's a close migration or a distant migration now the from the time the kerala has disaster uh, of extreme weather disaster and uh, people lot of people work in kerala the southern state had to come back and then covid happened so now migration doesn't seem to be the as lucrative option as sustainable option as an adaptation measure it was used to be so it further kind of underlines the importance of creating opportunities within sundarban itself and uh, dr hawk was talking about the education uh, let me share that in sundarban in indian sundarban the education level is pretty high but the employment is very low so there's a great disconnect between the education level and the employment level so really would like uh, all the experts to respond to that uh, to that very quickly uh, let me start with professor roy But what do you think? How important migration as an option, adaptation option, or we should look beyond that, Professor Roy? Yeah, uh, thanks, Dr. Basu, for raising very pertinent points because we are also closely observing this this migration issue. To uh, I personally feel uh, that uh, this should be considered more as a choice, not as a compulsion. So if we can really help the community the social cap uh, the human capital development to certain stage so if people are willing they can stay back they can right. they can uh, so but now what was happening in uh, in uh, in in the sundarban is more like a compulsion so and that is what is development means mobility and mobility is obviously everybody when a person is mobile he is more achieving and aspiration so i would consider that uh, i am not against uh, 
uh, migration, but not the kind of uh, constraints under which they have to migrate right. out, leaving their children right. without any caregivers. And regarding and linked to this, the, my, my point, the, the human capital development is through the education. What you have raised, we also uh, examined this that the Sundarban, particularly the Indian part of Sundarban, is, is having a, a good uh, literate population. But the problem, you know, that we were doing some work, we saw that uh, the quality of education, the, that is the, the quality of infrastructure, even in very large schools in Goshaba, Shagar, and many other places, which are having 1,500 children, they are dirt, there is dearth of science education. There is uh, infrastructure, Sci the lack of science education infrastructure, the, uh, the vocational uh, the, the capacity right. building. So I think these are the, what kind of, what is the infrastructure in these uh, education? Because otherwise people are migrating and that is the kind of compulsive, when say it is a kind of constrained migration. So both about, so, uh, both about so, quality and quantity. Yeah, I and, and that the quantity matters also the quantity so matters. It should be considered more as a choice, not as a compulsion. So okay. That I think uh, would be, would be very Great. Uh, very quickly to Professor Hawk, because uh, Indian Shindarbin being responded by Dr. Roy. Professor Hawk, uh, migration as an adaptation mode, uh, especially in context to the COVID and everything, uh, what do you feel, uh, how should be the process, uh, Professor Hawk? Well, to some extent, um, climate-induced displacement uh, which is the term used in the climate change negotiations to refer to climate migrants is inevitable and is already happening. Um, it's predicted to grow in numbers quite considerably. Um, it can be a very uh, negative impact on people or it can actually be positive if we can make it into a positive. Um, in Bangladesh, we are trying to make it into a positive through a program we call building climate resilient migrant friendly towns yeah. to create these other towns as migrant friendly towns so that people don't end up in the slums of Dhaka. Uh, otherwise they all end up in Dhaka and we cannot stop them from coming but we can incentivize them to go to other places. And that's what we are trying to develop in Bangladesh. Uh, to see whether we can make that work. It's an experiment. It's a, a see whether we can make it happen. Uh, but it's something we are actively looking at and seeing how we might be able to do that. But migration is unfortunately a fact of life we have to deal with. Uh, very interesting. Uh, already such such kind of townships or habitat centers being uh, already in place or the Bangladesh government is working on it? This is not the government of Bangladesh. This is the people of Bangladesh. People of Bangladesh. Yeah. So and they are one, the mayor of a town, one by one. Oh. The first town mayor was Mongla. The Mongla. second town mayor is Noapara. We have to persuade the local authorities to accept this idea and then do something about it. It's not really? top-down government telling people what to do. It's people deciding that they want to do something and then doing it themselves. And so we have identified about 20 towns. We are talking to the municipal authorities, seeing who is interested. At the beginning, it was quite negative. We took a lot of time to persuade them to uh, think of it seriously. The town mayor of Mongla is the first mover. He's moved forward with it. Other mayors are now quite interested. We hope that it will catch up and catch on. And at some point, the government may also support it, but it's not dependent on government. This is a people's movement. I think extremely important piece of information and a lot to learn. I think India and Indian Sundarban can actually learn from it, though I think the space is a big issue. Uh, in Indian Sundarban, we have a population density of more than 1,000 uh, here uh, per square kilometer, which is one of the very quite a significant one. Thank you. Let me, let me just, uh, ask Professor Roy and uh, maybe uh, Professor Lord to start that when you are working on the project, how important migration is in context to the recent developments and what you feel, uh, how the migration should be dealt with. Very quickly to respond to that. Um, sorry, uh, Andy, sure. you, are, you are going first, yeah. I'll go very quickly then. Um, it, it was always a part of the project and I'm sure Manoj will, 
we'll talk a bit more about it. But Men I remember Menaj and I having talks in the in the in the formulation of the project about exactly this idea of you know permanent migration versus um, migration to secondary cities, um, and, and and the interesting aspect of seasonality versus the the, the more permanent migration that ch climate change will bring. I was just thinking as the, the responses were coming from Zubinich and Salim, you know, about the, the effect of COVID and, and, and what that will do on, on migration might give us some insights into sort of some of the challenges we might face in the future, because it's, it's a stress test for the Shundabans <laughs> in many ways. And it will be interesting to see what might come of that. But in the interest of time, I'll, I'll pass over to, 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 to Manoj. Okay. Uh, very, right. very quickly also, Andy, thank you very much. I, I will just, uh, I'll just give two, two aspects of it. One is the theoretical aspect, probably colleagues probably are for uh, intellectually it is understood that there are at least eight different processes of human adaptation and mobility uh, is firmly established. You can also sort of, you know, think of this in, in a smaller number of three different stages of first is adjustment, diversification, and then substitution or relocation. So you can see that this is this moves progressively. On the, on the issue of really migration, how is it actually an adaptation is just surprising. And one of the things that we are in this project uh, you know, examining, we're using the term, already have started using this term called modular livelihoods, where we're really finding how people really develop a suit of different livelihoods to pick from, depending on which seasons they are. And in that, you will see the distant part of the Sundarban peoples are coming to city Dhaka for rickshaw pulling, going to the eat manufacturing places, going to even to harvest in another part of the country where harvest happens at a different time. So you really, really you can see that the diverse suit of uh, livelihood that is coming. And it is in this project, we are monitoring 12 months uh, 12 months of livelihood practices of 180 households located in six different hotspots in Bangladesh. So okay. hopefully in, you know, in years, in one year time, we should be able to say how livelihoods in Sundarban differs from say in Chor area, from the, you know, Southern Western, uh, uh, Southern Eastern sort of hillside and things like that. So this is an ongoing project, but the idea is really to pick how the livelihoods are shifting, in particular, theorizing this as a modular livelihood. Okay, uh, I think very important point and interesting point that uh, should be followed up. And uh, another quick pointer, which after which I will open the floor, is about the importance of having transboundary action. I think we keep on saying. I think each of the eminent panelists talked about, and uh, Dr. Ghosh said that there's no. Formal platform. There may be a couple of platforms, but they haven't reached the uh, level it should have been. Uh, my question, maybe I start with uh, Professor Hawk here. That uh, way Basu? back in, sure, please. Sorry, really sorry, Dr. Basu. I'm sorry. Uh, can I uh, just request you, uh, Dr. Devujati Das also had to make certain inputs after Pasna's uh, presentation. If uh, you could uh, allow him. Uh, See, I have no problem. The only point is, what is your time schedule? Because you have, we are yet to open to the floor. We have been in yeah, the last right, round. Right. Is that we have actually overshot. How long we yeah. can go on? 10, 15 minutes you can go um, on? Yeah, yeah, beyond the uh, schedule. So how much possible. time the coach will take? Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Das? Das? Because already the presentation has been made. Anything more to add to that? I am afraid I won't be able to stay beyond the hour. So, uh, because uh, that's what I was asking. That if, if he has any important point to make, I request that after we hey, quick if round, you could just quickly yeah. uh, okay. summarize your points. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Please go ahead. Sure. And we'll continue. Yeah. Okay. Just make the main point, please. Yeah. So uh, the. So the project we are doing is called Environmental Remedies, Climate, Health, and Livelihood in the Indian Ocean Region. So the main point I did highlight that came out as part of our study uh, is has been on to some extent. So we are a team of 11 participants, and it involves six institutions, as India, Bangladesh, Tanzania, and Mozambique, as you can see from this map. 
and have already been discussed by other speakers is transregional and transboundary. And we are also focusing on this whole idea of decolonizing the knowledge that is from the global north, particularly in the context of migration studies and adaptation. So already some of the speakers have highlighted how how this modernized and as Shibaji and Upashna, who are the two researchers in West Bengal world, and also people colleagues in Bangladesh who are working, some of the questions that has arisen out of this project are highlighted here. Uh, why some people migrate but others don't? And uh, uh, Upashna already mentioned about kind of immobility of women because of the patriarchal norms, caregiving role of women in the household. So these are the kind of broader questions that we are exploring through this project and which kind of directly links with the questions of adaptability and questions of the local level. And also, how does local adaptation look like in the context of the pandemic's reverse migration that has happened in the last one year and also the subsequent displacement of people because of cyclones. Uh, so these are some of the questions that okay. I quickly and there is also this whole debate, the minimalist and the maximalist debate uh, that is going around globally when we are talking about environmental uh, kind of disaster mitigation. We need to kind of also focus on how developmental policies depoliticize the idea of migration and kind of disaster relief uh, and adaptation. So that is another point that I wanted to highlight. Uh, and finally, we have these case studies in Bangladesh, the Shadnagar slum, and in India already mentioned in Sundarban, which is badly affected by cyclones and floods. Uh, some of the preliminary direction that our research is taking, which I would just quickly mention, is that internal and inter-regional migration is important uh, as international migration that we are talking about. Uh, we need to decolonize the methodology that I've already mentioned, and local adaptation is increasing defined by initiative and agencies of local communities like communities kind of have their own agencies they have their own politics needful about that a uh, low and rapid onset of climate change related impact will have differential impact of communities mobility and local adoption so there can be different ways in which people kind of adapt like I move seasonally they move tempor uh, temporarily out of the Sundarbans and they also sometimes move permanently when their land is completely lost uh, to embank uh, to erode as Upashana has already mentioned, photo voice and digital diary work in Sundarban has shown us that it has great role play in capturing community narratives of natural disaster during crisis and strip, as we have seen during the pandemic. It also empowers community to share their own story, particularly the most vulnerable community, women and kind of you know lower caste group, particularly Dalits and other communities. So that that you can wind up now. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So this is what I had to say okay. uh, from my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I think the important point, but would have been better to give you more time to elaborate on that. But very quickly, uh, uh, just just asking all the panelists how much time you have. Uh, it's now in Indian time seven twenty five. Uh, officially, we have till seven thirty five. So can we can we go on for fifteen minutes from now? Seven forty in fifteen minutes from now is okay with you? Yes. 15 minutes, okay, 15 minutes okay. from now, great. Yeah. So uh, Professor Hawk, 15 minutes is okay with you. I'll try, I'll have to do two meetings at the same time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you you always do that, thing. it's nothing new for you. I, I do that, you always do that. So uh, I'll try, I was just meeting 15 kilometers 15 away, minutes. Oh my God. 10 minutes ago. So, 15 <laughs> minutes. Ago. so uh, uh, just a question uh, very quickly, I think it's very important, that's why I think uh, I, Kind of talking about it, it was a transboundary initiative and Dr. Hawk, because uh, way back in 2010, uh, the other Indian Prime Minister and the Bangladesh Prime Minister signed an agreement on Shundarban. It's on joint action on Shundarban. And subsequently, when our present Prime Minister uh, went to Bangladesh a couple of years back, he also signed a couple of agreements on specifically on Shundarbans. Now, the point is, all these agreements are kind of put in a bit of a back burner. They have not realized the actual potential on ground. So with that background and with the civil society initiative that's happening, uh, there's a meeting uh, between the Bangladesh and Indian Environment Minister in 2010. There's a meeting at the sidelines of 2015. Paris COP between the other Environment Minister of India and Bangladesh. Dr. Hawk, how do you think 
the whole initiative can be taken forward. I think, I think that um, the upcoming visit by uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina from Bangladesh to India uh, is an important uh, event that we should try and uh, get input into if we can uh, to ensure that at the highest level of the two central governments, they take this forward and not get stuck at the level of provincial government uh, versus central government on the Indian side. Um, Shundaban is an extremely important um, ecosystem and the people living there are, are extremely vulnerable uh, to the impacts of climate change. So the, it's a problem that we share across um, the three countries, I would say, the India, Central India, Bangladesh, and West Bengal. Um, and so we must find a way. We have to find a way. Um, and we need to be engaging with the decision makers to try and impress on them the necessity uh, for doing that. I'll mention one other important factor on our side of the border. You may know that the uh, the bridge over the river Ganges uh, has been completed now. They're doing the final carpeting of the roads and it's due for opening in June of this year. Uh, as soon as the bridge becomes operational, it will connect Kulna and the Shundaban region with Dhaka city in a absolutely game changing manner. Now you have to take a ferry. It will take you a day and a half to get across uh, uh, from Dhaka to Kulna, then we, it's a matter of hours. You can go and come back the same day, even if you want to. And that will be a game-changing uh, uh, investment in that region, which can be a very bad investment because right now nothing is being protected and supported. So all kinds of uh, unsuitable industries and businesses are putting signboards up around the Shundarban. Uh, if they're allowed to put their factories up, then I'm afraid we are in very bad shape. We have to stop them putting their factories up. They can have their signboards, but not put the factories that they want to put there. These are all polluting factories. They'll destroy the Sundarbans. So, you know, on our side of the border, we are trying to impress on the government the need to protect the Sundarbans against the development. We are not against development. We want development, right. but we don't want the bad kind of development, which is what we have. And they must admit we have bad development and we don't want bad development anymore. We want good development and we can do that. Let's see. Okay, uh, very important point. Just uh, uh, first one is that uh, talked about that all the three partners in this whole process, Indian government, Indian national government, West Bengal state government and Bangladesh national government kind of need to do it together. I think it's completely doable because I've been part of this exercise for about a decade. And I find that unlike Tista, it's a win-win scenario. If Shundarban is conserved, both Indian part of Shundarban and Bangladesh Shundarban tend to gain. It's not like this stuff that you are speaking resources, you're adding resources there. So uh, I find myself working closely with the government of West Bengal in that context, that there's any reservation about working together with Bangladesh. So I think that's a win-win scenario. We need to build up on that. We need to work on that in a proper manner. That may be useful. And as for your bridges thing, I just hope that that will not add to more migration. Uh, it may end up being a physical passage to migration. Uh, very important, uh, Professor Hawk, just to see other responses. Uh, maybe maybe uh, uh, Professor Roy, uh, very quickly on, on uh, this issue of transboundary initiative. Manoj, will you like to go first because there's Azan going on? Okay. So. <laughs> um, no, no, I think yes. I, I, am, I can be a little provocative, if, if I may, if, if the panel allows me. I have a feeling that uh, the, the ecology of Sundarbani that such is defies, defies the norms that we apply on human settlement. Probably there, there are a set of meta, meta declaration, meta policies that, that the two, two, two governments and the three and the central and, and provision and the Bangladesh needs to come together. They, you know, they share the sheer certain value of this whole whole uh, you know, ecology as one system. At the moment, the two countries are too 
very you know divergent political ideology and uh, and that ideology and sometimes i was once talking to shobhanik in a sense that you know if indian government supports come to bangladesh and bangladesh civil society is so vibrant is that the indian government support through bangladesh government will arrive to bangladesh part of the sundarban much faster than the indian government's uh, their own support arriving to the you know uh, affected population in in the indian side so what i am wanting to really say that uh, you know the political ideological point set aside we need to sort of consider the whole thing as an ecosystem that desire right. its own principles and governance okay uh great other panelists would like to kind of uh, share any inputs on this particular thing professor La large and uh, I, i thought seven inches coming next but i'll just i suppose highlight the and we won't get an answer to it the ecosystem services paradox i suppose it's it's what salim says if if you want people to be supported you bring in development that undermines ecosystem services at the same time one of the greatest treasures that the, the sundarbans have is that they have a core area which are in, arguably according to the theory offers no ecosystem services at all because the people aren't there it's a world heritage site because it's a core area of where where it's people aren't there so we have this paradox of of what level of ecosystem services we can we can we 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 aim at but also what 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 we lose and then draped across all of that is 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 culture because the, cult, the culture is is it, it intertwined with the ecosystem services but the culture is 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 far more common than than, than maybe would generally agree you know um because it's two countries the, the culture is really common across the sundarban in terms of the livelihoods and the and the requirements on 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 the on the landscape so i think that's the basis to begin from is okay. a shared culture dr janto okay. may i just just uh, send one sentence quickly, please to, uh, to andy but andy um is there is there a, a, a debate around that uh, ecosystem also have a regulatory service that 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 benefits not just the local population but much wider population yes, absolutely sir. absolutely i agree with you entirely i mean the thing we grapple with in the hub is how we have the conversation about ecosystem services as a, as a topic because once you use that 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 term you lose half of the audience and if we want to talk to delta dwellers and communities we have to find another way of to, but yes regulating services is, is is a really key one but a lot of the aud intended audience might not understand the 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 sort of quite complex basis of that yeah uh, may i respond sure yeah i think uh, the great points uh, what andy said and what monoj is also uh, uh, mentioning that the ecosystem services but uh, certainly uh if we go by the culture that would be striking a chord because india uh, this is a kind of a syncretic culture which is originally a more like a religious harmony the islam and hindu and all so probably uh if we can start with culture the joint cultural festivals because on our side we have sundarban utsav and sundarban festival i think bangladesh also had something like that so along with what uh, dr basu is uh, saying that uh, something is happening at the national level probably take azina's visit and more at the political level we need to pursue but we can start with a joint festival kind of thing right probably there we can because the bon bibi and many other i think uh, there are various forms uh, local forms also which is actually original form and then that uh, uh, multi that actually uh, uh, customized according to the the kind of landscape level changes so if we can the, if something can be started at the community level in terms of shared culture right. and how it is evolving evolving culture then probably we can develop a narrative around eco ecosystem services because one of the ecosystem services is cultural aspect i i think uh, then probably much easier also to link the ecosystem services with the evolving culture and how it is getting a uh, kind of homogenized and getting extinct probably that discussion could can be uh, very meaningful absolutely i think that is tomorrow's discussion that ecosystem services i think ecosystem services all said and done it's still in its infancy in sundarban we are yet to kind of work 
the details on that, quantify on that, how it can be, uh, as Professor Hawke, I think, talking uh, and others are also saying that how the services, the value of services can go back to the people. Unless the value of services go back to the people, they will not be preserving it. So that's very important to have that connect. The dots need to be connect about the ecosystem services per se and how it is going back to the people at large. So that is very important. So let me uh, open the floor. Uh, 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 Dr. Mehta, how to go about it? People are going to ask through kind of question answer, chat, or how, or in person. Uh, sir, I, yes, yes, sir. If you, if you can, uh, uh, I, kind of... Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I see that we have only comments about um, about the presentations that have been made in the chat box. So we do not have questions per se. So uh, we we can use the two minute time to get experiences and ex uh, insights from the experts themselves before we can conclude. Have your concluding remarks. We don't see so any questions. Anybody? I think yeah. we can we can open the floor for anybody ask, asking question. So anybody would like to. Ask anything. Krishna, like a, Krishna, Ray. Krishna Ray, if uh, you can just speak and uh, ask your question quickly. Sure. Please go ahead. Krishna Ray, please unmute. Please unmute yourself. Oh, no, I'm not going to ask anything. It's just okay. 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 Uh, so it's it doesn't seem that uh, there are many questions. It's a too complicated. Yeah, yeah. Affair. Somebody's raising that. No, it's it's her own. hand. Somebody you can you hand. can just lower. No, it's Krishna Ray. Uh, you can, uh, lower your hand, madam. Just okay, to highlight, so, highlight something that was in, in the chat that the Durham University are coordinating at Delta's Futures Conference. There's a, a lot of really interesting material on photo voices in some of the presentations. And that's, uh, I've just put in the chat uh, on the 24th and 25th of March. I'm sure that they're, they're looking very keen for people to register for that, but it's, it's on, it's, it's called uh, Delta Futures. If you just Google that one word, deltafutures.co.uk, you'll find it. Okay, thank you. And as because there is no questions apparently on, on either in the chat or uh, in, in person, uh, very quickly, uh, all the four panelists, if one line, one line, one issue you think that needs to be reiterated or told, not being told, very quickly, uh, maybe a minute each, maybe, maybe may I start with uh, uh, Professor Lodge? Anything you would like uh -huh. to add on, very quickly? I think we're at a, a, a really interesting point in history. I think we're at the point where adaptation can be grasped, uh, as Salim says, like a, like a nettle. And, and, and we, we really need to grab that now. And there's a real drive over the next two years or so. I really thought those initiatives that were mentioned from the, from the ground up were, were, were the way forward. So okay. let's join together on those initiatives. OK. Uh, Professor Roy? Yeah. So just one point. I feel that uh, the locally led adaptation, there are uh, cases of uh, failures and there are cases of success. So I think uh, if we look into the governance or institutional aspects of uh, these uh, success and failure cases, which is ecologically sensitive, which is actually replicating well, so we, if we can see the governance aspect of these uh, alternative livelihoods and local adaptation, probably we'll get uh, some clue that which has potential for replication and uh, multiplication and which probably has something, uh, some, some problem in built into it. So that's okay. my only point. Professor Ray. Uh, Professor Hawk. Sorry, yeah, I was, I was talking mute. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I really, I really look forward to this transboundary element, uh, particularly Epar Bangla, Upar Bangla, that, that we, we have, we have been uh, growing up uh, listening to and thinking about it. And particularly, I think it would be very interesting to see the livelihood and the other transition that is happening in one side and the other side, and whether there is any element of cross learning from it. Yeah, right. Uh, Professor Hawk. Thank you very much. So um, recalling that uh, yesterday, 
was the 21st of February, which is the uh, International Mother Language uh, Day yeah. now, uh, based on the Bangladeshi uh, loss, loss of lives in, in defense of our mother tongue, which we share with you across the border. I think that's a huge asset that we yeah. need to be building on, and we don't build on it enough um, yeah. in terms of collaboration. And I mentioned that my center is now focusing our attention in Bangladesh in the Khulna region. Uh, I'll be traveling to Khulna uh, next, next week. We are doing a major in-depth assessment of the situation in Khulna with a long-term perspective and then the neighboring towns of Mongla, Nopara, uh, Gopalganj as well, and Shatkira, because that is really the, the hottest spot in the Bangladesh uh, right. climate impacts uh, geography. Or the whole country is uh, vulnerable, but that particular place uh, region is the most vulnerable. And as I said, the development opportunities that will come with the bridge can be very negative as well as positive. So we need to be very careful about what happens in Kulna town city and then beyond the city boundary in the uh, surrounding area. Um, and particularly education, uh, of the young girls and boys I mentioned, we are very interested in how to uh, improve that. And we would be very interested in collaborating with all of you across the border. I think this is a, a common agenda that nobody, uh, Jayanta, you're quite right. This is a win-win a uh, positive agenda. This is not a win-lose agenda in terms of you know water sharing or not water sharing. This is the same ecosystem. We have the same thing, same problems on both sides. It's in our common interest to preserve it and to help our people at the same time. Thank you. Great. Uh, just before I hand over to Dr. Mehta for the formal kind of wind up of the way they are planning to do, just a very quick comment. First is from the Indian Chundarban context that when you're talking about adaptation and other issues, we need not take the entire Shundarban per se. Because the moment you start talking about the entire Shundarban, it yeah. becomes too large, too big to be handled. I was going through the data and I find that in Indian Shundarbans, out of the 19 blocks that we have, eight are really vulnerable. Out of the 190 GPs we have, about one third are vulnerable. About 1,052 villages we have, about 25% are vulnerable. So let us prioritize the area of action. Let us prioritize the area of action on adaptation, take local people into confidence and all the other measures, make them something to see. As of now, the people in Shundarban are just looking at discussion, discussion and discussion. We cannot possibly look towards 2050, what's happening in 2050. We need to look what's going to happen in 2025, what's going to happen in 2030. So let us take the short term, then, build up on the, the long term. No point the 30, 50 years projection and doing all these researches. Already we know that Shundarban is vulnerable. Let it act on ground. Research is very important, cog in the will, but let the will to run, the will is basically action, that's number one. Number two, as for the transbound reaction, I am completely agreeable with the very eminent panelists. We need to look at locally, nationally, and transboundary. And I completely agree with Professor Hogwood, whatever little exposure I have to the issue, is, it's a win-win scenario, Un unless um, like the water sharing or everything, it's a win-win scenario. I know for sure the present West Bengal state government is willing to be part of it. In fact, few days back in Indian parliament, one of the parliamentarians from the government which rules West Bengal raised questions on, on, on COP26 and Shundarban. Actually, he called me up uh, about a day before the parliament session to know what he should talk about. And when I shared the Shundarban issue, he, he was all there. He, he mentioned that in the parliament. So I don't see any reservation from that. So that's very important. Need to link at the kind of dots and to find out, build up on this transboundary action, both at government level, but also at the intellectual level, at the kind of activist level, and try to find out a solution together. Sundarban is a too complicated area to only government to act, but also without government, we can't act possibly. So we need to take everybody on board and try to go ahead. Thank you, thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. And let me hand over to uh, Dr. Mehta for winding it up. Thank you. I don't think I have taken uh, much yes. more time than what- No, 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 
Absolutely not. Uh, so if you could just uh, briefly clarify about uh, uh, what you mentioned, uh, an Indo-Bangladesh common platform. Okay. This was a question that was asked by Saurav Sarangi and okay. this went unanswered. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, in 2014 or 15, a formal initiative called Bangladesh BISRCI, Bangladesh India uh, Shundarban Regional Cooperative Initiative. That is a, a platform being created where number of nonprofits from India and number of nonprofits and professional organization, research organization, think tank from both India and Bangladesh were part of it. World Bank was part of it. Uh, uh, the organization like WARF, WWF, uh, all are part of that. So there's a lot of exercise being done. And uh, I personally, from the communication background, media, we, we created a media strategy. Because along with the politicians who are the decision makers, the decision pushers are the media. And the next generation decision pushers are the young generation Dr. Hawk was talking about. So we have a media strategy in place already being done. It's being formalized. You can find it in the, uh, in the, in the internet as well. Or the, otherwise I can pass on uh, what has been happening. So we have reached to a certain level. So the, the important is to build up on that and to go to the next. So a lot of strategies being made. A lot of research has been made from this BISRCI, but uh, we need to build up on that. Very happy no, to thank share you, with sir. anybody who's interested yes. about it. Uh, I can always share more points on that. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now we uh, come to the end of the program. We have uh, shot uh, by more than 15 minutes. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development um, to all our experts who have, who have gathered here today and shared extremely, extremely rich insights um, and uh, to all our attendees here on Zoom and on Facebook Live, I would like to especially thank our chair, Dr. Jayanta Basu, all our panelists, Professor Shovinik Roy. Thank you, sir. Without your guidance, that this would have, have not been possible. Um, Professor Andy Large, Professor Salimul Haq, Professor Manoj Roy, and our presentations by uh, Dr. Upasna and Devu Jyoti, my friends. So thank you so much for uh, your uh, wonderful and proactive participation. I think this is a very important Top, topic and theme, which we all need to uh, continuously uh, discuss and coordinate upon so that we have really uh, proactive and action-based uh, uh, solutions uh, for this vulnerable uh, region of the world. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to thank the panel, uh, the attendees who would be, uh, who are watching here on Zoom and also on Facebook Live and to all those who would be watching us later on YouTube and listening to the podcast on different platforms. Thank you so much. And I wish you all a very good day. Good night. Thank you.